morning, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening, good to see you guys in here again. It's always a pleasure every week to get you guys in here. We're moving along great. Um, I put together something I think everybody will have some interest in this week. Um, we're going to do a little bit of uh, superficial on the positives and some negative stuff and uh, show you how to give you a little recipe if you ever want to transfer, transfer your glass positives onto some black leather or some other material. We'll show you a little recipe for that. So good to see you gentlemen in here. Pablo, Bogusla, Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Give me somebody to look at and talk to while we're in here. I know there's a bunch of people on YouTube coming in. And we, uh, we hey, it's Tim. We see Tim and Thilo and Steve, Renzo, Will, and Linda. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Let's jump right in. We'll talk about what we're going to do here. Should be a good one. Uh, like I said, we're going to do uh, a little bit of a uh, taste of everything. This is a great book. If you don't have it, go download it from Google. It is just the, it's a really uh, fine example of, uh, where's my view full screen here? Um, it's a fine example of uh, learning to do uh, whatever you want to in, uh, yeah, where's my, I don't see my full screen thing here. Sorry, guys, let me do this again. Sorry. Search menu. No, 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 we don't want that. Well, all of a sudden, I have now a problem. Uh, uh, just a good good example of, of learning. Uh, you know, the name of the book is uh, uh, The Textbook of Photography, and it's uh, the Universal Textbook of Photography, Instruction, Enhanced Formulas, and Useful Information. So that, uh, that there we go. That will be a good uh, jump in for uh, a good resource to have around in your library. Okay, here we go. So let's view this, present. And there it is. So what, and it's downloadable on Google Books. Google Books is my go-to. I have a lot of printed material. And pretty soon, I got my bookshelves up behind me. Pretty soon, you'll see a whole tons of those books behind me. But um, getting my little place set up here. Um, but go download that book, this book. It's a great one. Uh, today, we're going to talk about making positives a light approach. You're going to see a very different recipe. Uh, uh, in conjunction, going from Esther Brooks stuff the last few weeks and now coming in to some uh, Harvey Reynolds and Fowler stuff coming into here, you'll see a very unique approach. But again, this is all based on balancing these, this collodion, the silver bath, and the developer. So you're going to have radical variations from a 30 grain bath to a 45, 48 grain bath. So you're gonna see a, a wide variety. And we're gonna talk about the recipe to transfer positives on black, black uh, gl uh, glass to black leather or other materials. If you wanna try it, you can. And technical questions and answers and recommended reading and recommended watching, of course. So let's jump right on in here. I wanted to start by talking, th these gentlemen start out by, they're very uh, commercial oriented. So can you imagine in 1863 opening a, a photo studio to make portraits of people? You don't know where to begin. I mean, this stuff has only been around for a couple of decades. And, uh, and so if you're new to the process or new to the business side of it, they've got a lot of interesting information in here. But hey, Paul, good to see you. Miss the show, been watching football. Oh, no, football. Ah, come on. This is better than football for sure. Uh, no offense. <laughs> Watch the football, I guess. I don't. I don't know. I don't even know how to spell football, so I shouldn't even talk. But anyway, here's here's where they start. He starts about talking about the most important of all apparatus, right? Your furniture, as they call it, in your studio. The most important apparatus is the lens, of course. For unless it is a good quality, the best results need not be expected. Definitely. Therefore, the first consideration is to purchase one from a rep respectable house or of a good maker as a guide the purchase of the, as a guide to the purchase of them we should say Dalmeyer and Ross are the best English makers and Voigtlander and Jamin, Jamin is the best foreign one, foreign ones I love how explicit they are in these 19th century and early 20th century manuals they just come out right and say look this is gospel this is what this is the best recipe this is the best lens 
This is the best layout. This is the best methodology. I love it. They're confident. They did it for a living, so they should be. Um, there are, of course, many other very good makers, but these are the best, period. I, I won't argue on the Delmeyer side. I won't argue. But check this out. He goes on to say, or they go on to say, uh, for portraits, none expect the double achromatic lenses are used. And there is a great demand for their visiting card or carte de vis portraits, visiting cards, right? If they are required for this purpose, we should recommend a lens of large aperture, such as the Dahl Myers number one and number two B. And you see number one, 150, and number two, 220, 22 centimeters, 15 centimeters, and 22 centimeter uh, lenses. Uh, real popular ones today uh, are Delmeyer 3Bs. I have a Delmeyer 3B. Um, F3, 4, F3, 5, somewhere in there, 300 millimeter. Great lens. Um, I, I, I prefer that I have a Darlow uh, uh, or a, uh, uh, a Deroji that's just in, amazing. It's super fast. It's like a 2.8. Um, so very fast, big aperture is what he's talking about such as the 1 and 2B, the latter of which is the best visiting card lens we've seen. So he says the 22 centimeter fast lens is the best visiting card or carte de vis um, portrait lens. That's what my uh, Deroji is, is a, is a 22 centimeter, 220 millimeter lens. Beautiful lens. If these portraits are attempted with any uh, inferior lens, nothing smaller than a half size should be used. A full plate lens any, uh, answers very well for them. Disdary, I don't know how to say his name, Disdary, Dis, somebody in, in France or somebody that speaks French can tell me how to say that, but we'll just say Disdary of Paris uses a full plate Hermagie to produce his visiting card pictures. Um, there are such uh, lenses necessary, the gallery being 20 to 25 feet long. So he, now he's talking about focal length, and look at the size of the visiting card. It's four and a half by two and a half inches or 11.4 by 6.3 centimeters. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's a little smaller than a half plate size. And I tell you, my, my 220 Dalma or Deroji um, is beautiful on the half plate. It's just, it's absolutely gorgeous on the half plate portrait. Um, you can read the rest of that or get the book and read it, but he goes on to say the dipping bath for the silver solution should be glass or ebonite. Ebonite was a material like rubber, like vulcanized rubber. He badmouthed the gutta percha, uh, the, the typical kind of clay stuff they used to use, baked clay. It leaks, it cracks, it puts off stuff. He, he, he doesn't want it. He says gutta percha's baths are to be discarded. If you have one of those, get them out of your dark room, period, right? And we would impress upon all operators in photography the importance of having their chemicals the best quality and also the importance of cleanliness in mixing them. Of course, we know that. We, we practice those things today, of course. Um, all measures, funnels, and other glasses employed in the preparation of the solution should be chemically clean. I always recommend, and you guys know this, if you have my book or if you're taking a workshop from me, we separate out. We, you have a funnel for silver nitrate. You have a funnel for developer. You have a, a beakers for this, uh, containers for that. You never cross-contaminate this stuff, ever. You're just asking for problems. So this is what he's talking about here. Cleanliness. And really, we would say today, completely se completely separate those, those uh, vessels, if you will. That whatever you use in a particular compound, you mark it and use it only for that. Don't try to repurpose a silver nitrate funnel for your collodion or your developer or whatever, or vice versa. Don't do that. We are sorry to say that many uh, spurious, this is funny. We are sorry to say that many spurious chemicals are in the market. Photographers should never be led away by cheapness in purchasing chemicals or they will be sure to have a disastrous result. I love how direct and straightforward, and this is 1863. This is, this is an earlier book than I would actually maybe embrace, but after reading it this week, I, I embrace it. I didn't get through all of the 380 pages, but I, I made a good chunk of it. But they're very direct and straightforward saying, you know, gospel, this is, this is it. I love that. Just expect disastrous results. If you go on the cheat for your chemistry, don't expect to get good images. <clears throat> 
We should recommend all operators to use new triple crystallized silver nitrate for their dipping baths. It's made from pure silver dissolved in pure nitric acid and crystallized three times so that no trace of nitric acid or other impurity is left. We don't have these problems today, but you can see how they emphasize we want the very best for this. If we're gonna go through all of this stuff and have one bad compound in our process and fail commercially, these are this is the advice these gentlemen are giving. Um, triple crystallized, I love that. So they made, dissolved it in pure, silk, pure metallic silver, dissolved in pure nitric acid, three times crystallized and, and just get it out, get it out, get it out, get all that acid out of that, right? In, in distilled water, of course. Um, and then he goes on to talk about gun cotton is a substance which not all, is always to be relied on. We should advise all persons to make their own gun cotton or else <clears throat> to buy the collodion ready-made. There are several good collodions in the market and the manufacture of it is on a small scale is often attended with indifferent results. Meaning these are kind of customized small batch quantities like we see today. Um, some, of you, some of you guys out there buy chemistry from uh, distributors or, or makers today. He recommends uh, two or three of them. Uh, Mawson, one of you, he says, uh, we should say that Mawson's and Perry's are the best for positives and Ponting's and Disdary's are, and Mawson's for iron development for negatives. And this is, this is, uh, this is Desiree's warm weather collodion right here. And check out how he's emphasized the iodides in this. This is a very interesting, again, not unlike Estabrook stuff we, we looked at the last few weeks. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> Jeffrey says, no wonder the prices are through the roof on those. Lines. Yeah, they, I don't think they've ever read this book, but they're definitely of quality that way for sure, the lenses. Um, so he goes on to talk about um, the, the different makers. And it's an interesting, I was reading, and later we're going to talk about Bill J. And if you don't know who Bill J is, I'm going to turn you on to him today. Um, he goes on to talk about uh, Mawson's uh, collodion here. And Bill J has a, 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 I hope you've read this, a Dangers in the Dark by Bill J., um, great writer on photography, passionate photographer, passionate educator. He died in 2009. Um, he has a story in Dangers in the Dark where Mawson goes to this pit to get rid of some uh, nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin it was, I think. And he, oh, and he poured the gob out and it blew up on him. And he lost his fingers and his eyesight. This guy, Mawson, um, just... Crazy stuff. We'll get into that in a little bit. But he got th these gentlemen go on to say this is a cross section of a um, choice of place number two there. So you see this north light here. If I don't know if you can see my cursor, but between B and C, that is the north light coming in, and the sitter would be up against the A wall or the on the back of the A wall, about three feet off the A wall, and that north light had come in like that. That was a beautiful. And then he's got a long way to go up and down like if you're using uh, if you're using one of uh, Desiree's lenses he's got a long 20 25 feet you can move back and forth to do groups or singles whatever um, for those of you that have seen I just had my foundation poured for my studio and dark room out here my building my studio goes up on the 15th next week the 15th and 17th I'll have my studio up I'm gonna have something similar to this but not exactly I'm using the north actinic light coming into a 10 foot, uh, uh, three, uh, basically a, a two and a half, three meter opening uh, uh, by about uh, two meters high. And then on the top, it'll be open to come down and catch that north light. And the sitter will face the north light this way and from the top, and then I'll bounce on the shadow side. S very similar to this. I'm no longer going to use artificial light. My dark room and studio is completely off grid. I will have a small solar system in there for red light in the um, in the dark room, but I'm going to use not exactly the design they have here or in the 19th century liter literature, but very close to grabbing that actinic light. I don't need such large windows at, at 2,400 meters, right? I've got so much UV up here, and I'm only going to make 
portraits or, or images in that studio space during the best light between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. or 1400 hours. So that light, I don't need much. It's gonna, and wait till you see the first portrait come out of my studio, but it'll be very, very similar to this as far as light goes. And you should read through that gallery designer, that studio design, it's very interesting. Let's move on to coating the plate. So it is well to keep the collodion in a large stock bottle and to fill a smaller one from time to time. You know this, if you've read my book, if you've taken a workshop, this is how I operate. And this is the reason why. And it's a very good reason. And if you use any potassium salts in your, in your collodion, this is especially important because the, uh, thereby preventing the sediment being poured on the, from being poured on the plate, also giving greater ease to pouring. So what happens, collodion is constantly throwing down. So if you go from a large stock bottle where you keep your collodion, let's say a liter, and you can decant that off the top into a smaller pour bottle, um, you're going to have cleaner collodion. You're, gonna, you're not going to have this throw down as much, especially if you use the ammonium-based salts. So very good point there. And then he goes on to talk about how you pour the plate. And he talks about how difficult it is to explain this. And it, it, it definitely is. Um, and he says, the plate should be immersed in the silver bath until it sets or becomes firm. In general, a dullness comes over the surface of the plate. That's what we today call skinning over. In general, uh, <clears throat> no, sorry, no time can be given for this part of the operation. It depends on the temperature. It's very true. We've talked about this uh, a lot. In warm weather, the plate can scarcely be immersed too soon after being collodionized. So I just saw, uh, and I think I'm going to start doing this maybe next week. We're going to jump over to social media on my wet plate collodion uh, board and Facebook and look at some of these entries and just talk about them. And you'll see every single time this this is ad nauseum. I, I just I can't type that much stuff over and over again, and I don't have a copy and paste. I'd rather show them on here. But so drying out, overexposure, overdevelopment, all just typical over and over and over again. But drying out is a big one. People think you pour your collodion, and you if you're if you're new, you take so long to pour it and get it over and then drain it off and then get it into your silver bath. People think drying out happens after the silver bath. No, it happens before the silver bath entry. That's where you dry out. Very rarely, unless you're in a very hot, dry area, you're not going to dry out after your silver bath, very often. I mean, it can happen, of course, but your drying out is gonna take place between the pour and, the, and dropping it in your silver bath, and that's what he's talking about here. It says no time can be given. In warm weather, the plate can scarcely be immersed too soon after being collodionized, meaning you're going to dry that out. You're going to skin over very fast in hot, dry weather. If kept too long, some parts will be more sensitive than others, the driest parts being the least sensitive. That's why it's called wet collodion. So if you barely start drying out, if you're in warm weather, like in the northern hemisphere right now, you have a good chance of this happening before you, if you're not paying attention. Um, you're going to have dried areas. You're going to have less sensitivity. That's why a lot of times you see the dark kind of vignette around the plate. That's what's happening a lot of the times so if it's not done mechanically. <clears throat> if the clothing gets too thick, it can be thinned by the addition of a little ether. If dirty, it should be filtered through a clothing filter. So my recommendation is this. Not only do you have a stock bottle, a pour bottle, but you also have a clothing drain bottle in my methodology. And that's where you drain the plate. So you drain all that collodion off your plate. That's going to have a different constitution of mostly ether and a little bit of alcohol, depending on your temperature. So you reconstitute that drain bottle with ether, mostly, and a little bit of alcohol. Filter it back into your, your pour bottle through a non-bleach coffee filter. That's And he's calling it a collodion filter. We call it a brown non-bleach coffee filter. <clears throat> Exciting the plate. For this purpose, a solution is required of what? Triple nitrate of silver, 30 grain. Look at that 30 grain bath right there. 30 grain bath he's using. And we'll look at the developer he's using with this. Very, very different from a 40, 45 grain bath of Esterbrooks, right? This stuff will start to gel with you. You'll start making the connections on this. And the more you think about it and read and listen and learn, the more connection you'll make with these this harmonious, a synchronized collodion 
silver bath and developer. You'll, you'll start getting that. It'll start making sense. And you'll start seeing problems in your own methodology, prob problems that come up on your plate. So you'd be going along fine, and all of a sudden something changes, and you, oh my God, what happened? You'll be able to start connecting those dots. Um, everyone kind of remembers this, right? I always show this. But here's my example out of my book. This is a 6.8, it's roughly a 30 grain, right? 68 grams. His is 65 grams, 66 grams, but associated with this highly iodized collodion. So right off the bat, you can tell he wants a highly iodized collodion. That's what he, he's using a 30 grain bath for. Um, then he goes on to say, you, you, you'll see his recipe here, or you saw his recipe there, uh, or does there is recipe. He goes on to say, the solution having been mixed in the above proportions, a plate coated with collodion should be immersed in it for three or four hours to iodize it. We talk about exciting the bath, right? Imparting those iodides so your bath fills up with iodides but doesn't get so full like the elevator and you kick people out and they develop, they, they precipitate on you out on your plate and leave little black holes or black dots. Um, you want it iodized so it doesn't steal from the plate. If you don't iodize your silver bath, it'll take from those first couple of plates, they'll be flat, nasty, no contrast, all that stuff. But after a couple of plates, especially in warm weather, it'll iodize your bath. But he, I always say, put a, put some old red collodion or your collodion on a glass plate, throw it in your fresh silver bath overnight, take it out the next day and you're good to go. Three or four hours, I've done it in a couple of hours to be honest with you, but just to be safe. And then he says, the addition of a few drops in dilute nitric acid or acidic acid is ready for use. The collodion having set is rested on the dipper and plunged in quickly into the bath, taking care not to pause or a line will be formed across the plate. We call these hesitation marks. If you pour your collodion plate, it skins over, you put it on your dipper and you push it down in your bath. If you go boop, boop, boop like that, you'll have distinct lines. We call those hesitation lines. So he's talking about make a nice, nice plunge into your bath not so fast that you splash it, right? But just a nice plunge into your bath. Taking care not to pause or a line will be formed across the plate or hesitation lines. After the plate has been in the bath about one minute, draw it out once or twice. I always tell people this, don't be afraid, especially if your bath is heavy with solvents and you haven't had a chance to aerate it, pull it up every minute in the red light. Just move it around a little bit like that. That'll keep that ether, that'll keep those lines from forming. And actually, even if you don't have a heavy solvent bath, it'll, it'll produce a better uh, silver iodide and silver bromide on the plate. That double decomposition process is happening. <clears throat> Once or twice to allow ether to evaporate. Place it in the bath again for another minute or until the greasy lines disappear. We call those rivulets. Remember those rivulets you see? It is then taken out, drained on a blotting paper, and put in the carrier of the dark slide prepared side downwards. So that's all, everything, I always say this, but everything in my book comes from these 19th and early 20th century books because they did this for a living. They knew the problems. They knew how to resolve those problems. And they knew chemically, for the most part, what was happening, uh, especially in the uh, silver nitrate and the salts and things. So... He goes on to talk about exposure. You can read that on your own. I'm going to move to the development of the, the picture here. Number seven. I'm on my third espresso this morning, so forgive me if I get outrageous here. <laughs> Number seven. To develop the picture, you require a solution of ferrous sulfate. That's a reducer. Nitric uh, uh, potash. That, that's, that's potassium nitrate is what we call that today glacial acidic acid, alcohol, and water. So below here, I've, I've laid out one liter. I, I was working a liter because I like percentages. I like to know, and I'm terrible at public math period and public math, terrible. So I like to lay it out and let you see what the percentages are and you can compare them to what you use. So one liter distilled water, 26 grams of ferrous sulfate, 2.6, right? Not very aggressive. 12 grams of potassium nitrate, KNO3, uh, saltpeter. 30 mils of acid, 3%, 20 mils of alcohol, 2%. This is in a 30 grain bath. This is a one liter of distilled water and 65 grams of silver nitrate or 6.5% of silver nitrate. Um, 
Take the plate out of the dark side, hold it in the hand the same way when pouring on clothing and put about a drum of the solution into the developing glass and pour along the edge of the plate sufficient uh, of the solution to quickly cover it and then gently incline the plate to allow the solution to flow, flow back, flow backwards and forwards. Be careful not to pour the solution in one place or you'll burn it. I call it a developer burn. If you took your plate and turned your cup up and poured it, it it'll burn. It'll create a dark spot. So he's talking about come to the edge of the plate. My technique. If you have my videos, go watch the development. You'll see the technique that I use. Now check this out. This should be interesting to some of you guys. Um, fixing the picture. One liter distilled water, 22 grams of potassium cyanide. I use 20 grams, which is basically 2%. This is 2.2. And one gram of silver nitrate. How about that? Putting a gram of silver nitrate in your potassium cyanide. Why do you think that is? It is potassium cyanide loves silver nitrate, silver iodide, anything silver. It just loves it. It'll eat it up and consume it up. So that helps remove the, the uh, fix the image. So this is the probably the first recipe that I've seen other than maintaining your silver bath. This is the first recipe that I've seen where KCN or potassium cyanide is added to the fix. Interesting point. That's what's fun about reading these old books and then sharing this information with you guys because it is a uh, cornucopia. It is a big basket of various methodologies and you can pick and choose what you like and try and experiment. It gets interesting. Pablo says, as for the silver bath, could it be excited with plain iodine? Yes, it can. In fact, um, you, yes, yes it can, period. Um, you can add, a, on a liter, you can add 0.5 grams of potassium iodide if you want. You can use straight iodine if you want. Anything that will produce those, saturate that bath with iodides. Uh, you just have to be careful on the amount. You don't want to start your bath off with pinholes, so be careful with that. Jeffrey says, does the KNO3 act as a restrainer? Yes, it, it is a restrainer, absolutely. It does two things, and that's a great question, Jeffrey. It does two things. Primarily, <clears throat> It deposits silver in the highlights, cleaner, more massive, brighter silver, if, if you will. It'll make it snappier. It'll make it brighter. We talk about bright whites and dead whites. KNO3, potassium nitrate, saltpeter, whatever you want to call it, will increase your brightness. It will silver the image up. It will cool the image off visually. It won't have that uh, coffee and cream like my coffee down here, coffee and cream color to it. It'll snap it up, and it does act as a restrainer, absolutely. A little bit. Not a very strong one, but not like glacial acidic acid, but, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Facebook user. Kudos and kudos. Oh, thank you. Customized Studio, best of luck, and thanks for oh, – you're very welcome. I don't know who that is, but thank you for that. Um, there's Dale. Quinn, is that not an aggressive ratio of potassium nitrate? There you go. There you go. That's exactly why I'm sharing this, Dale. These, these, again, please keep in mind, that's why I give the bath, the collodion, the bath, and the developer together. You, you don't want to break these apart. This is not going to work well broken apart. Harmonious, synchronized compounds, right? These three that we're talking about. Um, it is a very, over 1%, 1.2%, super aggressive, absolutely. So you can imagine how snappy with this, this triplet combination, you can imagine how, how snappy that is. It won't result in overly bright highlights, Dale, if your exposure's right, unlike this copper sulfate kit people are on. I don't know, I, I have not seen that in any literature, none. I don't know where that came from. Um, that will result in that um, for a sulfate. Yeah, gotcha. No, I don't, it, it's, it's an aggressive amount of KNO3, no doubt. But in combination with the bath, combination with the salts and the collodion, um, and the proper exposure, of course, you'd, you'd be fine. Um, but good questions and good comments on that. Just uh, I, that cyanide is very interesting. All right, let's talk about transferring your positives onto black leather. So in the 19th century, at least here in America, in the 19th century, a small piece of plain window glass, as we call it today, was very expensive. And the more, more perfect it was, the more expensive it was, right? So a lot of times they transfer the positives off onto black leather, make leather types. And leather was cheap, abundant everywhere, you know, hides of animals. So 
he talks about Niello paper here, but we're going to we're going to talk about transferring it onto leather. It's the same process. The method of transferring is adopted by the Americans much more frequently than in England. Transfers on black leather instead of paper. Exactly right now. If you get the right type of paper, this Niello paper, for example, I don't know if you could find that today, but you might be able to. But you could do experiments and transfer onto anything, basically, that will accept this. Uh, and, and we'll talk about what the chemistry here is. And put it in your contact frame or your press, whatever you're using for an hour, and pull your glass off. This is that's what They could re clean the glass and reuse it. And it was very cost effective. And beautiful, and it does two things. Think about this. You don't have to back it with anything, and the laterally it laterally reverses it back to the position of a non-direct positive, which is a, a net printed negative, right? In other words, the uh, text on my shirt here wouldn't be backwards. It would be correct if you printed that onto black leather from a direct positive. So a couple of interesting points there, or whatever, however you want to take it. Um, to take them, it's necessary to have a good positive with thick collodion. This is the key, thick collodion. We talked about Esther, Bo Esther Brooks, uh, um, how viscous, how thick the collodion is and how important that, that alcohol and ether is to get the, the image into the film, not on the top of the film. This is what he talks about and not powdery and not powdery. I've seen people, they send me videos and photographs of images just sloughing off in the fix, writing right on top of the clothing, just slough right off, right? That's what it is. That's what he talks about being powdery. So a thick collodion, which is tough and not powdery. Those are the prerequisites for transferring positive images onto another material. So the mixture, you prepare a mixture uh, composed of water, 29 mils of water, 14.8 mils of alcohol and a half a mil of nitric acid. So think about what that's doing. Alcohol is a solvent, water is the carrier, and nitric acid will actually assist in keeping the, uh, um, it will assist in the transfer process, let's say. That's the easiest way to put it. After the positive is dry, it is floated over with the mixture two or three times. So. Pour it on, pour it off, like you're kind of like you're uh, redeveloping a negative to take away any grease. At the same time, <clears throat> is done with the glaze side of the leather, let's say in this case, or whatever you want to transfer it on, on which you're going to transfer the picture. So you pour on, uh, pour off the fluids, laying the black cloth with a wet surface upward or the, the, the transfer piece upward, and you put your positive down on it. Then you clamp it in. I would say use a, a contact printer, right? That would be a good good process to use. Uh, put them both in a pressure frame in a warm place, in a warm place for about an hour. That, that'll keep the collodion soft, softer. It's wet. It'll keep the alcohol as a solvent. It'll keep it wet. The nitric acid will hold everything together, and the water will, will also, um, you know, assist in allowing you to peel that plate off. <clears throat> Uh, for about an hour when they will be uh, be dry and the leather will leave the glass quite clean. That's that's the nitric acid helping that come off. Very interesting. Uh, in yellow paper, you can look that up. Uh, substitute for glass is made of thin sheets of different photographic sizes. Enamel black on both sides. Kind of like a flexible ferrotype, if you will. But if you want, you can look the yellow paper up. But that's the recipe. I always said, if you get what I call fish gills in your wash water, if you have a positive that it, the clothing's peeling up off the edges, you get that little fish gill, and then all of a sudden your image comes off the plate. I always say take chopsticks, and I, I used to do this, and put it on uh, bottles. I had a big wine bottle, a big, like, I don't know, four-liter wine bottle, uh, gr dark green, and I put all my floaty images on that. It, portraits, it turned out really cool, but they weren't as slick as this would be. This is this is a way you can actually use compounds to assist you in transferring those positives off the glass. Um, if you transfer on leather, do you still varnish it? Yes, you do, and you can. Yeah, absolutely. Because remember, Linda, and that's a great question. 
because what you have on that, you're, you haven't varnished the glass plate. Just keep in mind, right? So those of you that think this is only after, you know, you, after washing it, after it, the plate's ready to be varnished, you don't varnish it, you transfer it. Um, and the important part here is, is if you don't varnish the silver, that's pure metallic silver reduced on the plate or the leather or the whatever you transfer it to, um, it's exposed to the air. And the air, depending on where you live, could be very polluted. There's sulfides in the air. Sulfides hit the silver. Silver sulfide is black, just like your grandma's silverware, you know, the old, our good silver that you, it tarnishes, you clean it off with the cleaners. Uh, you can't really do that with photographs. So you need to protect that with a varnish, a gum sanderac, a, a shellac, a modern varnish, whatever you want to use. Yes, great question. Um, let me just check this and make sure we're good to go. Yes, okay. So that is transferring to another uh, um, support, whatever you want to call it. Let's talk a little bit about this. This is this is really fascinating to me. Um, you're going to recognize this if I can explain it properly. You're going to recognize this if you make negatives or if you haven't made negatives yet and you want to. This is a great uh, way to approach it because I think a lot of people actually do this and they don't even know it. This is called negatives by iron development. It's like what? What do you mean by that? So let's just read that first little part. The fact that a negative can be produced in dull weather. So this is what I always say. I don't have any sun. I live at 50 degrees. I don't, you know, whatever it is, right? I, I hear this from people all around the world, or if they're in the Southern Hemisphere, vice versa. Um, but so uh, negatives can be produced in dull weather when one cannot obtain the direct method. And we're going to talk about the direct method next, but I'll, I'll explain the verbiage he's using here. Is a sufficient reason for this process being generally adopted, meaning this is a great process to use if you don't have that, you know, 2400 meter UV light to make negatives with. Um, this is a great way to approach making negatives. And, and it is. Check this out. It has many other advantages. For example, producing greater softness and harmony, producing thinner negatives. They're by requiring only a quarter of the usual time for printing and giving much more brilliant prints. That is quite a statement, I will say. It is necessary to produce good pictures that everything should be in the best working order. The silver bath should be made of the purest nitrate, again, free from acid, with only a tray triple use, blah, blah, blah. He goes on to talk about that. And then he goes on to talk about the collodion again. Here's Disneries and Mossens and Perrys and Pontings and all those. A judicious mixture of any of the two, these will give excellent results. Right there, he's saying, if you have a couple of these, mix them together. You produce really great stuff. And if you look at the recipe on those, you just saw Disneries, um, highly iodized, very high, just a typical negative, right, making uh, collodion. Um, uh, if you have plenty of light and good weather, use this arrays or parries. If otherwise, use Mossens or Pontings as they are quicker. The manipulatory details are nearly the same as for positives. Interesting. Patent plate glass should always be used for the negative process. The crown glass is not being flat enough to bear the pressure in the printing frame. Right there, it, it, it indicates the cost of glass back in the day. And the cheap stuff you got had waves in it. You can go to these old barns and these old places with clear glass windows and look at them. They're all wavy. And, and if you put that in a contact frame, what he's saying, you'll break that negative trying to get it pressed up against the glass. Very interesting. Just little things that you, you want to pay attention to as you're reading this stuff. <clears throat> the exposure should be longer than for a positive, of course. The same iron developing solution for positives is used. This is where we get into this negatives by iron development versus direct negatives. This is interesting. Um, in summer, 15 grains of iron to the ounce should be used. In the winter, it may be increased to 25 grains. So you're talking about 33 grams a liter or 55 grams a liter. Just keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, the picture, uh, the development should also be uh, continued longer than for a positive until all the details are fully out. The picture at this stage should look like an overexposed and overdeveloped positive. So a good negative does not make a good positive. We know that. We've talked about that ad nauseum. 
The plate having been well washed should be redeveloped. So here's the catch, guys. He's taking basically your positive process, making ambrotypes, tintypes, ferrotypes, alumatypes, whatever you do, and right as you you develop that, you you over you overexpose it. It looks overdeveloped. Basically, it kind of is, right? And then you go right to the redevelop. You hit it with pyrogalic acid, citric acid, and distilled water. So I just broke it down there. The 10 grains, 20 grains, 2 ounces. I went to a liter again. So it's 2.2% pyrogalic acid, 4.4% citric acid, which is the restrainer. That's You can hit it hard, right? And 1,000 mils of distilled water. Pour this over the plate once or twice then return to the developing, developing glass and add a few drops of the solution of silver, 20 grains to the ounce, okay? So this is basically your redevelopment for negatives, but you're doing it in kind of a positive process. This is what's called iron development. This is what they call iron development. Um, <laughs> here's Dale being a smart ass. If it is dull weather, just add some copper. It will brighten it up, yeah. And it will blow all your highlights out too, Dale. That's right. Hello, Facebook user. Welcome, welcome. So he goes on to say, um, so, so positive process, you go right to this kind of uh, diluted redeveloper, if you will, right? I use three times as that uh, pyro in my negative redevelopment. But And, and some 20 grain silver bath. Mix with the glass rod and pour over the plate. The picture will rapidly grow more intense, the proper intensity of which will have to be learned by practice, then wash well and fix in a saturated solution of hyposulfate of soda or uh, uh, thiosulfate, hypo, right? Interesting, he's not using KCN, super aggressive. This is a thin negative that's been redeveloped. It, I found this very interesting when I read it this week. It, very interesting stuff here. Um, so he goes on to say, uh, the great difficulty to a beginner in this process is the proper intensity to give his negative uh, or her. I, I, he's very sexist in this writing, obviously, but he should endeavor, if possible, to see one and examine it. In other words, this is what I tell people all the time. Here's uh, Joe or Sally in remote part of the world making images, and they think they're great, right? They think they look good because there's something on the plate. And then they get around somebody that has actually well-exposed, well-developed, well-processed plates. And they're like, oh, my God, are you serious? My plates look like shite. This is what he's saying here. He's saying, go look at a, what is supposed to be. Go actually physically see something that you're trying to, whether it's positives or negatives. In this case, he's talking about negatives. But go see because you won't understand what you're looking for unless you see it. <clears throat> so go go see one and examine it, right? Take notes on it. A good iron negative should be thin and full of gradation. In fact, it is possible to get a negative that will give a vigorous print whose highlights are no stronger than the one that will not produce a print at all. A very interesting comment there. This arises from the relative gradation in a good negative from a bad one. Exactly right. He's saying he's not focusing on the positive, looking for it as a positive. He's looking for it as a negative. Transmitted light versus reflected light. That's the key. And we've talked about that quite a bit as well, too. <clears throat> In a, uh, let's, let's go on here. In a good negative by iron development, the deepest shadows are generally rendered by clear glass, right? So your void areas are clear. Your shadow areas are clear. Put your finger behind it, it you, pure glass, clear glass. And the other shadows may be only a few tones higher in the scale. With the highest lights, uh, with the highest sh uh, shadows, maybe, okay, with the highest lights, very weak and still, a good print may be obtained in short time, which is a great advantage of these negatives. You may sometimes obtain a beautiful negative by the application of iron developer alone by using a neutral bath, like five pH 5, pH 6, but it will be generally found that a redeveloping is required. So we've talked about pH and the process in the silver bath. It really lays that silver on, right? The, the, the higher the pH, the more neutral your bath is, 
the more that double decomposition is going to lay silver down. That's why you can get what we call a foundation negative, sometimes right out of the camera, just with an iron developer. It's dense enough because you have enough uh, material there to produce that. Very, very interesting, at least to me. And he goes on to say um, down at the bottom here, um, the black drapery appearing is gray. The picture altogether destitute of vigor. When the negative is dry, it should be varnished with a hard varnish, such as Sokinese or Anthony's flint varnish. I don't know what those are, but I thought that was interesting to read that. Uh, brand names. And I guess, I guess we have that today as well, too. So let's talk about the contrast of that, the direct negative. This is what I... I don't teach that iron development negative. I teach the direct negative, right? I, that's what I teach. So we go on to say, um, this plan is, uh, is still followed by a few operators who excel in it. But for portraits, we think we have said sufficient on the other process to make it more generally adopted, owing to its greater quickness. For views, copying, the direct method is still generally used. Uh, that's, that's what I like. Uh, I, I haven't I haven't done the other one, so I, I'm not really sure. As the details for taking positives are nearly the same for this process, we shall only give such additional directions as the difference in manipulation requires. Patent plate glass should be used for this process also. The silver solution should be stronger than for positives. So he's going 35 grains here in the summer and 40 grains in the winter, right? So that's why we have different uh, different recipes for the summer and the winter. To be iodized in the same manner for positives, to be made only slightly acidic by the addition of a few drops of acidic acid. Again, we are going for a more neutral bath, making negatives than for positives, right? We want a heavy, the heaviest deposit on that plate we can get. And that neutralized, that pH being higher will help us do that. Pontings or Disdere's collodion may be used as they answer extremely well for pyrogalic development. The plate should be allowed a little longer time in the bath than for positives. We've talked about that as well. <clears throat> the exposure will be about twice as long. So if you read um, Archer's manual, his uh, uh, negatives on glass or whatever, I can't remember what it's called, but that's what he talks about, time and a half two times longer. So if your good positives obtained at 10 seconds, let's say, a good negative will be between 15 and 20 seconds. It just depends on your environment and your subject and your light and your lens and all that stuff, right? Uh, here, here's his recipe. Uh, the developer should be pyrogalic acid. Um, and this is a thousand mils for me. 4.4% glacial acidic acid, uh, 17 mils and alcohol 17 mils. You, you, you see where we're going with that, right? Very aggressive, super aggressive stuff there. The solution will not keep longer than a week, therefore it should be, not be prepared in large quantities. I just gave you a large quantity recipe. You can break that down into whatever you want. 1,000 grams is easier to work off of for me. The developer should be modified to suit the weather. In cold weather, as much as three grains of pyrogalic acid may be used, right? So jump that up, right? And in summer, it may be reduced to one grain. The picture should be developed with this until all the detail is brought out with little intensity. <clears throat> then pour back into the developing glass and add a few drops of silver solution. Again, 20 grains to the ounce, stir with a glass rod, and go over it again. So he's, he's using the same process. He's using the pyrogalic acid as, as a developer, and then he's adding a 20 grain silver bath, a few drops as a redeveloper or a, a strengthening solution. <clears throat> Fix with a saturated solution of hypothiosulfate or hypo, um, hyposulfate of soda in preference to cyanide of potassium. Wash well, dry and varnish the plate with good spirit varnish, which will not crack. The best varnishes for negatives, we have used the French varnish of, there we go again, Sochini, Francais, or whatever, Ferrer's, and Anthony's Flint Varnish. So basically the first one is making, basically making an overexposed, overdeveloped positive and redeveloping it on the fly. And this direct method is the method that I usually teach and use to make negatives. Interesting stuff. I thought you guys might find that interesting. So 
Let's see. Dale says, Quinn, as he increases the silver content, should the salts salts content in the clothing increase or, or with the rain? Uh, uh, I think if you're asking that question, Dale, that, that Desiree's collodion or Mossens or Perry's or Pontings are pretty much all the same. And those contain the percentages of salts, like that first one that I showed you. Um, yes, that 30 grain bath needs to match those salts. You use a 40 grain or a 45 grain bath, you use a different percentage of reducer in your developer, a different amount of acid or types of acid. All those things have to join up and match and, and talk to each other, if you will. Because once, once those one of those things are off, you're going to have, you're, you're going to be out. You're going to be out, out of har harmony, out of synchronicity with the whole process. And, and just go on a Facebook forum board or Facebook page and look at the stuff people post up there. They have no clue what they're doing. They don't even know what their chemistry is, and they're wondering what's wrong with their plates. And it's, it's number one, not harmonizing this chemistry. So they can't get a good exposure. They can't get a good process on it, you know? So, yes, everything has to be synchronized, uh, which is a fair question. So anything, any, anything else? I'll wait a second if you guys want to poke around and, and see if there's any questions out there. Um, Yeah, I, Dale, uh, well, actually, I did an entire show. I did three shows on advanced chemistry. One was collodion, one was a silver bath, and one was developer. So three weeks we covered those ideas in harmony and synchronicity, and you'd have to understand um, all those things, that basic photochemistry, all that stuff. And, yes, it, it does, It's a, it definitely matters for this, and, and especially when you're trying to do, when you're trying to make those, really super clean, well-exposed, well-developed images like the 19th century. People always ask me, Quinn, why, why, why are those 19th century images so much better than the ones we see today? This is, in large part, this is the reason. It, this is the reason they perfected this stuff. They knew how to use light. They knew what their chemistry was doing. They knew all of those things that we don't know today or we don't pay attention to. Most people today, honestly, they slap some stuff on and get something to show up on the plate. They're good. They, they're, they're, they're happy with it for the most part. If they stay with the process or if they want to do negatives, they're definitely going to have to improve and understand this process more and understand it better to be able to even troubleshoot their way through the most basic stuff. Um, yeah, no problem. No problem at all. Anyway, so I'll, I'll, we'll take questions. I'll, we'll move on here. Um, I wanted to introduce everyone. If you don't know who Bill J was, you need to know who Bill J was. Bill J is probably one of my favorite unknown photographers, writer, uh, advocate, um, just amazing human being. Um, people say, God, Quinn, you're so passionate about photography. Well, you should meet Bill J. If you think I'm passionate, <laughs> you should meet Bill J. He makes me look like a part timer or even less. Um, one of the things I really love to encourage people to read is this document here, Dangers in the Dark, Stories from the 19th Century. If people say they didn't have many accidents in the 19th century, read this. It's all cited. There's all citations on every entry. You can go back to all the journals and read it. It is littered. They are littered with accidents, explosions, poisoning, uh, just littered, absolutely littered with them. Um, and there's a whole lot to learn from that. Granted, we don't have open wood burning stoves in our studios anymore. And, you know, we wear gloves and eyeglass, you know, usually safety goggles or whatever, personal protective equipment sometimes. Um, so there's a lot to be said in the 170 years since this, as far as safety goes. But um, there, this, this is just, this document is just a must read. And he talks about boiling silver bath and everything else in there. So um, Jeffrey says, uh, all the tin types I've seen at antique shops are always so clean, no island strike. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, you're going to see, yes, you'll run into a bummer once in a while, maybe some fly-by-night photographer doing something here or there. But considering most of those images are 150 years old or older, I mean, that's pretty damn impressive. And, yes, they use larger lenses to make smaller images, they weren't into the great big, how big can I make my image kind of thing. 
They made small images on larger plates, cropped them in, super clean, all that stuff, got critical sharp focus. They understood their light, their chemistry. Absolutely. It's true. I, I get asked that quite a bit. How, how did they do all that when, you know, our images look so, so crappy? Um, that's, that's how they did it. They understood the chemistry, the light, and their equipment or furniture, <laughs> if you will. Co Chopper, Carson, good to see you, brother. Do you think these different combinations produce distinct visual difference of images or mainly? Definitely. Uh, both. Both. Uh, visual differences for sure. The, uh, when we're talking about positive images, we're talking about looking at a plate and using reflected light bouncing back to our eyes. When we're talking about negatives, we're talking about putting light through a plate and how it appears on the paper and what the gradations, how it prints. So positives, you're going to see definitely cleaner, brighter, more distinct. Uh, obviously, it has to do with the optic and the light as well, too. But yes, both parts are true, Chopper. The distinct visual differences and, um, you know, they were worried about speed to some, some extent, but they were more interested in the, the, the perfection or the cleanliness of the image. Yes, good, good comment or question both. I like that. Are you suggesting I should be quite secure with my small hole plate? Oh, I don't know about you, Dale. I, I might worry about size up there in Nova Scotia. I, I might be worried about size. Yes, uh, I always say I always say this. People used to ask me, why don't you make, this is before I got in, well, this is before I got into making large plates. And I did large plates for a reason. I did the American West portraits of the large the bit first series I made 40 by 50 centimeter plates, and it was it was it was going off. It was using the uh, 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 Jackson and Watkins uh, um, throwback to them, and some painters from the 19th century out west here making large uh, vistas of the landscapes. And I was playing off of that. Basically, I used the large plates for a reason. But I used to be asked, "What's your favorite size of plate?" And I tell people, "Quarter plate." really quarter plate, just about that big. And I, I put them in a gallery and I'd have a bunch of diptychs or triptychs of quarter plates and people would walk right up to them to get, get a really just intimate. I just love seeing people get right up like that, you know? And I felt like I was, there was some connection there going on, looking at the detail, looking at all those wonderful things that, that you can see versus stepping back from a large print or a large plate, you know? The old adage, adage is, if, if, if people don't like your photographs, make it large. And if they still don't like it, make it color, right? That, that, that's the old adage of getting, getting somebody to like your photographs. I want people to um, be into my, my, I consider my photography intimate, mostly portraiture work um, that I've done over the 20 years in Collodian. Uh, and, and I want people to be intimate and, and get close to that and really feel what's going on there and even smell the images, even the varnish and the lavender oil on them and stuff. <clears throat> you mentioned you have done three advanced chemistry workshops. Are they available? Yes. Yes, they're, they're, yes they are. Um, you, you can go back and look at the titles on them. Advanced chemistry, we did collodion. It's all from Esther Burke's uh, book, uh, synchronizing and harmonizing those three elements, the collodion, the silver bath, and the developer. In fact, we just ended it the week before last, I think. I, I can't keep this time just this time gets crazy. So yeah, go back, go to my um, YouTube page, YouTube slash Quinn YouTube.com slash Quinn Jacobson, and you'll see him up there. Pablo says I'm working on a camera to make six by six cent beautiful. Uh, yeah. And and yeah, that's a great, I mean, there there's something special. I, I images don't there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That's that's like a carte de visite, like a, like a visiting card. That that's you know people always think bigger is better, and, and if you have good reason and there's there's beautiful stuff out there that's big. No, I yeah I get it. I I, I understand that, but don't discount the small intimate images. They they can be super power. I've seen it many times in galleries and shows that I've done, and pe they, people fall in love with them. There 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 there's something special about that. Good for you, Pablo. I'm looking forward to seeing your work. Um, so back to Bill J. Bill J. died in 2009. Uh, Dangers in the Dark. He's written a lot. He wrote uh, On Being a Photographer. 
with David Hearn. If you don't know who David Hearn is, he's the founder of Magnum Photography. Um, a lot of great photographers. Uh, Bill Jay has either influenced. He started in the late 60s in England. One of the things I love about Bill Jay is this difference between American photography and English photography. And please, I love my brothers and sisters in the UK. Don't come down on with, with a bunch of nasty email. Um, I just relate so closely with what Bill Jay has to say about um, the differences in the approach to photography between Americans and English folk, or especially back in the day, 40 years ago. Um, we had, I, we put a stone on an archer's grave in Kensal Cemetery, Kensal Green Cemetery in London. And we, I invited uh, a bunch of photographers, clothing us all over the world to bring work in. And we had in the dissenters gallery at the cemetery, we had a show, uh, an exhibition uh, of work from all around the world. We, we, to raise money for his stone, it was about 5,000 US dollars at that time, about 2,500 pounds. Um, to raise money for that, we offered the plates, the original glass plates for 200 pounds a plate. I didn't, we didn't sell one of them, unfortunately. Um, I wondered why. I wondered why the RPS wasn't there. I wondered why we got a little write up uh, on BBC somewhere sometime, but I was really disappointed. I was really heartbroken. This is one of their own. This is Frederick Scott Archer. And I let two English blokes lead it, right? I, I didn't take forefront on it. I let, I let a couple of English guys uh, take, take lead on it. But when you watch what I'm about to show you, Bill J, if you watch this movie, you'll understand why that is. And, and, and he's the one that enlightened me about relationships and about academics and photography and different cultures in photography and things like that. And I found it very, very interesting um, seeing what he went through in his life and that he pursued what he did. And I just... I just, he's just an amazing guy. So I encourage you to read this doc. Just Google Dangers in the Dark, Bill J, just like the title there. Read that article, read that essay. You'll, you'll love it. It's it's a fun read. Um, it's it's very interesting. And, and above all, uh, go on and read. He's written so much about uh, photography. Here's the book I'm recommending on being a photographer. Um, this is, yeah, like I said, this isn't a book of photography technique or equipment or darkroom skills, it's, it's a way to look at the way a photographer works. It's a conversation between Bill J and David Hearn. And, and, and just, if you don't know who David Hearn is, you should look him up as well too. So to be consistent, um, I, I'm gonna recommend you watching Do Not Bend, The Photographic Life of Bill J. Free on YouTube, it's an hour and a half show. Um, just wonderful, goes through creative camera, uh, all his work, um, all, all his interactions with these different photographers. It's just a wonderful documentary film. And, and if you're interested in photography at all, um, watch this, watch this uh, documentary. I'll go ahead and play it in this trailer here and check it out. My name is Bill J and I'm talking to you from Tempe, Arizona. When I saw a bunch of photographs which I didn't understand, uh, then I would contact the photographer. My memory is that it was just a ring at the door. You, you know, and suddenly there was this guy. I came into the room and I looked the guy up and down and said, hmm, this is an interesting character. The reason I accepted your offer to be included here is because I hold the guy in such high regard. I personally think he's the most interesting writer there's been on photography. He owed a lot of money and um, he just got out of everything. He escaped. He was a lone voice in America. He was a beacon of hope, really. He was an evangelist. Bill was a catalyst for all of us. He was the flame that started it all. The meaning of that is unintelligible, and so it should be. I went until you see the context of that. He had a real uh, contentious relationship with academia. Although, and he teach, he, he taught, uh, he taught at the University of Arizona in Phoenix. So, 
Um, watch the film. You'll love it. It's it's powerful. It's moving. It's uh, one of those things that you get to uh, enjoy uh, and, and learn a lot about uh, photography itself. And more importantly, about the approaches, uh, the different approaches to photography and, and his interest in how photographers work. Uh, very, very interesting gentleman. Um, and, and I won't I won't give it completely away, but he had a very interesting request when he died. And you'll see that in the film. It's it's moving. It's very powerful. So that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I have uh, I have come to the end of my uh, one hour. I have a contractor showing up at any time now. We're doing uh, uh, we're doing. Um, uh, let, let me do this real quick. I'll show you this. I can at least show you this for those of you that are interested. If you're not interested, you can scoot on out of here. But if you are interested, hang around for a second. I'll show you what is going on. Um, uh, yeah, this is it here. Let's share this again. Boom. Go to stream. Okay, here we go. Share. Share a screen. Uh So this is uh, just this is my blog. Uh, this is a funny photo Jeannie shot of me the other day. With found some deer antlers up here, and I put them on my head. Um, so this is uh, there's a little greenhouse. We got that up. All our plants are in there, doing great. Uh, this is uh, pouring the the foundation for the studio. There it is, 16 yards of 4,000 psi concrete. There it is, poured with that beautiful vista to the southwest looking north as it's drying and there it is that's what we have sitting out there right now so this week my building will go up i'll start finishing out on the inside and hopefully we'll get out there very soon and we're going to start taking you through some of my stuff that i'm going to do and i think i hope you'll find it um interesting uh what, I, what i'm about to embark on and do um this uh, this has been a journey this has been so incredible. Uh, it's been emotionally and financially exhausting, but so worth it. And I'm so excited. When you live so remotely like I do, way up in the mountains in Colorado, it's hard to get anybody to come up here, let alone bring all their equipment and their laborers and workers. And I, I can do a lot, but you know, there's a lot of things I can't do. But this will open the door for so much um to to work to do work uh if you look there's my house right there on the side so i can just walk out of my house go to my greenhouse uh there's the guest there's the guest house right back there <laughs> um but uh this will be fun i don't know because of covid i don't know how when i'll offer workshops again but um for those of you that are, are interested and um can come up to the mountains and spend a week up here we'll do some amazing things I'll get to know this light. I'm tracking the light right now. I'll know everything about the light up here, at least in the studio. Traveling around might be a, a bit different, but you'll find uh, what we do in the studio, at least virtually here, a lot more interesting, I hope, or, or as interesting, <laughs> or probably more than me babbling about this stuff or reading old books to you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a, uh, Yes, yes, the, the Red Mother Earth series. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's that's what I'm calling my, this next project I'm doing. Uh, Jeffrey just brought that up. Red Mother Earth. I'm going to photograph. This is the Ute area of the Native Americans, and I'm going to photograph some of their their unbelievable what they their sacred their sacred rock formations, basically. And I'm going to do that on these beautiful whole plate glass plates, and I'm going to make oil prints of them. I'm using the soil here. This is all red. You can see in the photograph there how their decomposed granite is red. Uh, mix that up and put it into my my inks that I'm going to use to make the oil prints for these. I have. Remember, David came on the show. Um, I got my my all my brand new oil brushes here. I'm going to do oil oil on glass from wet collodion negatives and so. We're going to go through that process. You'll see me make work. You'll see me we'll work in the studio. i got to figure out how I can do some of this live or I'll tape it and then come in on the weekend and show you guys and that kind of thing. So 
anyway, that's uh, that's a little bit of a uh, little bit of my life photographically. I'm excited. This has been five years, and I'm jonesing to pour plates again. I'm jonesing to get out to the studio in the dark room. And when you don't have one, I have my dark box and everything. But when you don't have a studio and you're you're doing negatives and printing, you need a you need a little space to do that. And and so I'm really looking forward to that. So. Thank you for spending your hour and 10 minutes with me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so appreciative of you coming in here and watching this and listen to me babble. Send your photo, uh, send your email or your images, whatever you want to talk about next week. Um, I thought we'd continue on. There's some really cool tidbits in that book that I'll share again next week. Um, well, you're very welcome. And Mr. Sharp, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Will and Renzo. Thank you, Steve, all you guys. Appreciate it, Jeffrey and Bogoslav, for hanging with me live in the visual arena. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Have, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll show you my studio up next week. How about that? Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao.